Darktable 3.6 has either just been released or is just about to be released, depending on when you watch this video. The devs have been very busy once again. In this video, we are going to look at some changes to the preferences and the changes that have occurred within the light table view. Let's go. Hi, and welcome to episode 95 of Understanding Darktable. Just a quick little intro for those people who are either new to this channel or new to Darktable in general. The way the numbering system works for the versions of Darktable is that there are two stable releases every year, usually one around this time and another one on Christmas Day. And the stable releases are always given an even numbered version. So 3.0, 3.2, 3.4, and now 3.6. In the period in between those stable releases, when the devs are working on new features and tweaks to existing tools and all that sort of stuff, the version number is incremented to an odd number. So 3.1, 3.3, 3.5, and we're now on to 3.7 as we enter the next development phase for well, presumably will be 3.8 at Christmas. Now, the reason I bring that to your attention is because as I am recording this video, we are about one week away from the release of 3.6. I am running a very late build of 3.5. And when I say a late build, I mean I installed it about 20 minutes ago from GitHub. And... So all of the features that are going to be in 3.6 are in this version. Pretty much all that's happening in this late stage is the squashing of bugs. So pretty much everything should be functioning as it will do when 3.6 comes out. Okay, so where should we start? Well, we'll start with preferences. There's only a couple of things to mention. One is in Darkroom, and right down the bottom, you will see Show Mask Indicator in Module Headers. Now, by default, this is checked in 3.6, so you won't have to go looking for it. This will be active by default. I only bring it to your attention if for some bizarre reason you choose to want to deactivate it so you can come in here and uncheck it what exactly does it mean show mask indicator in module headers okay let's randomly jump into an image like so let's say i was to go into lo local contrast why not it's here it's open it's visible if i was to create a mask of any type could be a uniform mask could be a drawn mask could be a parametric could be a parametric and drawn mask doesn't really matter if I do anything, let's say I've created a mask that looks like that, whatever that happens to be, you will now find that on the header of the module, there is a new button. And as you can see, this module has a parametric mask. Click to display. Module must be activated first. So basically what that is doing is saving you from having to expand the module, go and find this button, and let's face it, on some of the modules that are quite tall vertically, it can be a bit of a hunt to find that mask button, and to then click it on. Now, even with the module collapsed, you can simply click that button and the module is turned on. Now, as the tooltip says, the module itself must be active at the time for that to work. But I do like that. That's a nice time-saving feature. Uh, next up, in the Security tab, you will see the very last option, Ask Before Exporting in Overwrite Mode. That is checked on by default. If you are super confident that you want to use the overwrite mode on conflict in the export module and you don't want to be bugged with are you sure you want to overwrite existing images? Then you can go to preferences, go to security and uncheck that final option. And then using overwrite mode in the export module will not nag you 
about overwriting existing images. So use that with extreme care. But if you feel confident, go for it. All right, next up, under the presets section of the preferences, you will now find an export button. This button will allow you to export all presets that you, the user, have created. So it will not export the default presets that come with Darktable when you install it. But anything you have created can be exported via this export button. And the beauty of that is this is my main machine. But let's suppose I was going on the road and I was going to take my laptop and I put Darktable 3.6 on the laptop and I wanted to take all of my presets with me. I can now export them to a folder, copy that folder to a USB key or across the network to my laptop, and then in my laptop, bring up this same preferences dialog, go to the presets tab, click on the import button, and I can then import all of my presets. Just to show you how it works, click on export, point to a folder, I'll go desktop, I will recommend that you create a folder because otherwise you'll just end up with a couple of hundred files on your desktop. So we'll call it presets, go create and click save. And then if we jump across to our desktop, there's our folder presets and there's all of the manually created presets that I have in my instance of Darktable. And as you can see, it covers everything from collections to you know, development modules to the export module to metadata presets, your module group presets. Pretty much any preset that you can create can be exported through that export dialog box. Pretty cool. Next up, some preferences have been moved out of the global preferences menu, so in other words, out of the preferences window, to options within the presets menu in individual modules. But it doesn't say which preferences have been moved. It just says that some of them have. I'm referring here to the blog post announcing the release of 3.6. I guess as you go looking for things, you'll soon work out what things have been moved to the presets menu on certain modules. And finally, for preferences, zoom scaling on 4K and high DPI displays is fixed so that 100% zoom level is now one to one pixels, no matter the viewport pixel scaling. I have no idea what that means, but if you've got a 4K monitor, it probably makes sense to you. Okay. So that's the preferences. Let's move on to the changes that have occurred in the light table view. The biggie is the new import dialog box. And by the way, this is scalable, so you can make it as small or as large as you want, which is handy. In the top left-hand corner, you've got places, all of your, well, your home directory, your pictures directory, and any attached hard drives will always appear here. And you can add new places that you want Darktable to remember by clicking on the plus icon just above it. Once you choose any of these places, the folders that exist within that place will be shown in the bottom left-hand corner. As it happens, I have some photos that I do want to import. So I will click on my photos drive, go photos, go commercial work, and I'll just select 2021. It then shows me any images that are in that parent folder. But if I also want Darktable to look recursively at any child folders which exist inside of this folder, I need to click the recursive directory button and that will then show me all of the images which are not only within my 2021 folder but in any of the folders underneath. I can tell it to ignore JPEGs if I don't want the JPEGs imported and I can tell it to only select new pictures if I have previously imported some of these images. Once I have done that, 
Uh, I can see there's 129 images selected. I can click on Add to Library. You'll also see you've got some buttons down there for Select All, Select None, Select New. Very handy, should be pretty self-explanatory. Add to Library. And so there are all of those images. They were already on my system. They just needed to be imported in their current location. If, on the other hand, I had images on an external memory card that I wish to copy and import, then I would at first mount my drive. So that's my drive mounted. Click on copy and import and the memory card shows up under places. I would then go to the folder that contains all of the images. I could tell it ignore the JPEGs and I might say select none and let's just grab four or five files. Now, this is where things get interesting. We still have the base directory naming pattern that we've always had in the preferences dialog. And we have the subdirectory naming pattern. And as you can see, I've set it up to be exif year, then a child directory with exif year hyphen exif month hyphen exif day. That's the folder structure that I prefer when I import my images. The only thing we're missing here right now that would have me ditch Rapid Photo Downloader is a browse button at the right hand end of this base directory naming pattern field that would let me just point to a new parent directory because it assumes that I'm only ever going to use one parent directory. And that's not how I roll. As I've said in the past, I have a folder for my commercial shoots. I have a folder for my family photos. I have a folder for my road trips. I have a photo, a folder for my personal shoot projects. And it'd be just nice to have that little browse button which would pop up a dialog box and let me point to another folder as you know, my base folder for importing. If that was there, I wouldn't need Rapid Photo Downloader. I realize now that that's really the only reason I use Rapid Photo Downloader. Okay, so it's pretty cool. We've now got this pointing to my test shots folder, which we'll do for this example. And my folder structure will be set up as year and then year, month, day under that. Tick the box to keep the original file name. Uncheck it if you want to use, you know, any variables to create a naming pattern. Uh, for those who are not aware, there is a page within the Darktable manual called variables. If you just Google Darktable variables, it will be the very first result you get back. That page has, oh, Seriously, there must be 30 or 40 variables that you can use to create both folder structures and file names. It's really powerful. I personally am quite happy to keep the original camera generated file names when I import my photos. And that's all I need. I don't need to keep this window open, but it is good that they've got that option there. So if you want to import one batch of photos to one folder, but then import another batch of photos to a different folder, you can do it without having to re-invoke the window. So that's pretty cool. So copy and import, and Darktable has then copied those four files across for me. And we can be sure that that is the case by clicking on an image and checking the full path, and it's actually in Photos Test Shots 2020, 2020 and the original file name. So nice work on the new import dialog box developers. Thank you. Uh, as you can see, there's a few other bits and pieces there. Ignore the EXIF rating. So if you've uh, created some sort of rating system from within your camera, and that information is written into the EXIF metadata, you can tell Darktable to ignore that at the time of import. Most of the rest of this stuff has not changed. However, there is now tag presets. 
let's suppose, for example, I wanted all of these images tagged with, well, microphone, because there's a microphone in there. So we will add microphone and these were shot at Audio Brian. So let's suppose that you regularly import images where two or more of your tags would always be used. So for example, I would quite often import images where I want Audio Brian and microphone to be added to those images. So what I can do is create a preset and in this instance, I'll just call it Audio Brian, click OK. And now I can use that as a tag preset here and it will add whatever tags exist within that preset to all of the images as they are being imported. Pretty cool. Oh, one other thing before we move on from the new import dialog, you can also view a thumbnail of the image before you import it simply by clicking on the little eye icon over on the right hand side. And that will show you an icon of or a thumbnail of whichever images you happen to look at. So that's handy. And you can just click it again to turn it off. I don't imagine you can do them. Yeah, you can't do them all at once. It, it's only one at a time. Better than nothing. Be handy if you could multi-select and then have all of them show up. But anyway, it's there for those that need it. Moving on, the Collect Images module has now been renamed Collections. Uh, this is just to somehow provide some clarity and consistency with other areas of Darktable. Uh, you can now toggle between the film roll view, which has always been the default view in the Collect or slash collections module and the folder view. So control shift anywhere in this list will toggle between folder view and film roll view. So just, I've just realized I haven't got Keymon running again. I'm a shocker. Sorry, people. Okay, so control shift and click and you're back to film roll, control shift and click and you're back to folder view. On top of that, if you are in the folder view, you can click on any folder and it will show you images which reside in that folder, but not any child folders. So in other words, these three JPEGs are living in the parent folder 2021, but there is also a bunch of child folders. If we want to see all of the images that are in child folders, but not these images which are in the parent folder, we can control click on the parent folder. And so now we're seeing everything that's in all of the child folders, but not the images that are in the parent folder. Or we can shift click the parent folder, and now we are seeing the images which are in the parent folder, and then all of the images which are in any child folder folders as well. Next up, the geotagging module has had an update. And for anyone who shoots functions of any description, whether it be corporate functions or weddings, where you have multiple cameras, this is going to be handy. The ability to offset day, date and time has just got a whole lot easier. So when you choose an image or a bunch of images, you will see the original date and time in this second row. That's why it's grayed out because you cannot change the original date and time, but you can go into the line above for date and time and change the date information or the time information and click on apply date and time and the offset will be applied and shown in this third row of data. So the number of days it's been offset and then the hour, minutes and second offset. So that is a really nice, just elegant way of doing those time offsets. 
And like I said, if you shoot any kind of functions where you're shooting with multiple cameras, if the cameras didn't have their internal clocks synchronized before you started shooting, then two images that might have been shot you know, at the same time at the event might appear with timestamps that are five minutes apart. And so this is a great way to then modify those timestamps for, for all the images from one camera by the requisite amount so that, you know, image from camera A and image from camera B, which were shot simultaneously, appear side by side in your light table view when you are sorting by time shot. Very handy. There's also some updates in the map module, but I will confess I've not had time to really dive into that because I've been trying to wrap my head around <laughs> all of the main stuff like the light table and the darkroom. Uh, I think, if I'm not mistaken, there's more map sources here than there used to be. I don't think there were always, always that many. Uh, but it certainly appears that there's some more stuff here. The geotagging module in the map view uh, has a bit more information here for GPX files. I don't have a satellite tracking device, so I'm a little out of my depth with GPX files, but I'm sure if you use a handheld navigator, you would understand how GPX files can come in handy for tagging your images. Another new feature that I absolutely love has to do with the tagging module. I've just gone back to these images that I imported as a test. Let's suppose we, I, I'm going to create a new tag just temporarily. So I'm going to call it test parent and go new tag. So that new tag has been created and has been applied to those five images. Now I'm going to create test child one and go new. That tag has now been created and added to those five images. And then I'm going to create one more called test child two and create that. This is where the new feature comes in. Now this applies only in the tree view. So you need to click on this little icon here, list and tree view. I can now drag any tag onto any other tag to create a parent child hierarchy. So grab child one, drop it on top of parent. And that is now a nested tag within test parent, which is the parent tag. And I can do the same thing with child two. I can either drop it on child one or I can drop it on parent and create a nested hierarchy of tags. That is really nice. Uh, I can see myself using that a lot. So very handy indeed. Next up, the styles module in the light table now has a reset parameters button, which will remove any styles that you have created. I'm not sure why. I suppose if you're a person who uses and trashes styles on a consistent basis, like you, you know, you might create a, a bunch of styles for one commercial project that you're working on. And so you create a bunch of styles and then once that job's finished, you no longer need those styles and you just want to reset rather than having to go through and remove each one individually. You can simply hit that reset parameters button and any styles that you had in your styles module are gone. And last but not least, there is a series of new icons across the bottom of the grid view in the light table. I left this till the end because I think this is really nice. So we now have a single click icon for the file manager layout. That tends to be where I spend most of my time. The next one is the zoomable light table, which will allow you to use your mouse wheel to zoom out and you can simply scroll on the you know, blank space off to the sides in order to scroll through your collection of images. And then you can 
zoom back in again. Of course, you are at the mercy of either your CPU or your graphics card as to how fast it can render all of the thumbnails, but that's the uh, ability to switch between file manager and zoomable light table. Then you have the culling layout in fixed mode and the culling layout in dynamic mode. I will confess I've not looked at those because I basically never use culling mode myself, but I will brush up on that in the coming weeks because I will cover that in an upcoming video. And then my favorite, there is now a dedicated button for a single large image view of a single image. In prior versions of Darktable, you always had to hold down either the W key or the, I think it used to be the Z key at one point. So now we just have this single large screen preview of one image, which we've not had, you know, without having to hold a key down. So that's great. Now, you will notice, of course, that once you've gone into this view, there are no buttons. So how do you get out of it? Uh, it is simply the escape key, and that will take you back to whichever of the preceding four views you were last in. Like I said, I spend most of my time in the file manager view. So that, my friends, is a look at the preferences and the light table with regards to all the stuff that's new in Darktable 3.6. I'm sure your head is spinning and we haven't even looked at what's changed in the darkroom yet. Alrighty, questions, comments, feedback, please sing out down below. I've got my work cut out for me with some of the stuff in the darkroom view and yeah, I think that does it for this one. I will catch you in the next one.